Greetings, true believers, and welcome to another star-spanning episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This show is sponsored in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to contribute and vote in monthly polls, you can head over to patreon.com slash marymarvelite and sign up for as little as $1 per month. Today's episode, of course, begins with two alien races, the Kree and the Skrulls, both of whom were experimented on by powerful cosmic entities early in their evolution. On the planet Hala in the Pama system, in the greater Magellanic Cloud Galaxy, the Kree's prehistoric ancestors were visited by an ancient race called the Progenitors. These alien visitors advanced the Kree's evolution by exposing them to a substance called Primogen, making their descendants stronger and faster than other mammalian species. These natives of Hala would subsequently evolve into both the blue and pale-skinned Kree. The Skrulls, meanwhile, were natives of the planet Skrullos in the Drax system of the M31 Andromeda galaxy, who were visited by the space gods known as the Celestials. The Celestials traveled the universe experimenting on primitive species, often resulting in the creation of three separate branches. Eternals, who were immortal and godlike, Deviants, who were genetically diverse, and latents who were seemingly unchanged but endowed with potential for future mutation. Evidently, the Celestials also performed this process on the Kree at some point, but Kree Eternals are small in number, while the ultimate fate of their respective Deviants is unconfirmed. The Deviant Skrulls, meanwhile, became the dominant species of their planet. Because the bodies of the Skrull Deviants were permeated with unstable molecules, each one had the natural ability to alter their shape and appearance by mental command. Rallied by an alien deviant named Tantalus, the shape-changing Skrulls overran their planet and hunted the Skrull Eternals and Latents to near extinction. There is of course more to tell when it comes to ancient Skrull history, such as how the last Skrull Eternal fell in love with the deviant Skrull Headwoman and both ascended into godhood, or how a subspecies of sorceress Skrull Deviants were driven from Skrullos and fled to the Black Galaxy, where they independently evolved into the race known as the Dire Wraiths. The Skrulls subsequently established their empire and began expanding across the Andromeda Galaxy. They used a reality-altering device called a Cosmic Cube, the first example of one being created in the universe, to aid in their conquest, with the Emperor fancying himself a god. However, the cube itself was corrupted by the Emperor's egotistical personality and lashed out, destroying two-thirds of Skrull space. After gaining sentience, this cube eventually evolved into the being known as the Shaper of Worlds. The Skrull race reverted to barbarism, but after several thousand years, they began to rebuild their galactic civilization. This time they were less warlike, instead basing their empire on interstellar commerce, becoming a more mercantile species. Under the rule of Emperor Dorek I, they expanded into other galaxies, starting with the Greater Magellanic Cloud. This galaxy, of course, contained the Pama system where the planet Hala was located. There, the barbaric Kree were ruled by their strongest male warrior, Morag. However, the Kree were not the only intelligent species native to Hala. A race of telepathic plants called the Kotati also evolved there, and both species watched as a ship from beyond the stars arrived on their planet. There are conflicting reports over exactly when this happened, with multiple sources claiming the Skrulls arrived on Hala roughly 10 million years ago, while some others place it closer to 1 million. In either case, the Skrull Emperor, Dorek, declared that this world would be welcomed into the Skrull Empire and would share their science and technology. However, only one of the two races could be considered the dominant species on Hala, and so Dorek I put forth a contest. 
One group of each race was taken by the Skrulls, 17 Kotati and 17 Kree, this being considered a round number by Skrullian metrics. Each group was brought to a lifeless moon in another galaxy entirely, the Milky Way. An artificial atmosphere was created for them to survive, as well as enough supplies and rudimentary scroll tools and technology. They were given one standard year to build, and whichever race accomplished the more impressive feat would be declared the true rulers of Hala and represent their world in the Skrull Empire. Despite being a race of barbarians, the Kree proved their capacity for ingenuity using muscles and machines to erect a great blue city. The Kotati, meanwhile, used their telepathic powers to discover ancient seeds and water buried deep beneath the surface of the seemingly barren planetoid. They used these to grow a beautiful green garden, a symbol of their harmony with nature. The representatives of both species were then brought back home so the scrolls could make their decision. The exact details of what happened next vary slightly depending on who you ask. According to the Kree, although Morag's tribe should have won, the treacherous Skrulls had been bribed by the plant people. However, this is likely propagandic speculation on the part of modern Kree. The Skrulls believe that the Kree had merely heard rumors of a Kotati victory and reacted the only way they knew how, with violence. In either case, under cover of darkness, Morag rallied his entire race with one single command. Kill the Kotati. And in a single night, the Kree waged a terrible genocide against their peaceful neighbors, driving the Kotati to near extinction. However, the violence didn't end there, and the Kree next attacked the Skrull delegates, claiming their weapons and technology for themselves. That was the end of Emperor Dorek I, and the beginning of the Kree Skrull War. Now, one might assume that an intergalactic empire could easily crush a barbaric race who were just taking their first steps towards space travel. However, by reaching across such unfathomable distances while their infrastructure was still recovering from the disaster with the Cosmic Cube, the Skrulls had stretched themselves too thin. It took the Skrull Empire years to even learn of Doric's fate, and their slow response gave the Kree the one thing they needed. Time. Time to learn, time to plan, and time to build. They mastered the Skrull technology quickly, and with their own armada of ships, the Kree soon colonized and dominated other planets in their galaxy, beginning their own interstellar empire. By the time the conflict between their empires erupted into intergalactic war, the Kree had advanced to a point where they were able to fight it. At one time, the Kree sought to create a cosmic cube of their own, similar to the one used by the Skrulls eons prior. To discover a method of doing this, they networked the cryogenically preserved brains of the greatest Kree minds who had ever lived into a techno-organic computer system called the Supreme Intelligence. However, the Supreme Intelligence foresaw the dangers of such a thing and refused to help them build a cosmic cube. But that computer system would eventually become the ruler of the Kree. Meanwhile, not all Kree were violent and a pacifistic group banded together, eventually becoming known as the Priests of Pama. However, the priests were looked down upon by the other Kree and driven into hiding in the slums of Hala. There they meditated and honed their martial arts skills until they received a telepathic message. Following the psychic voice deeper underground, the priests discovered the survivors of the Kotati genocide. These remaining Kotati had rooted themselves to the ground and concentrated on further developing their telepathic abilities, sacrificing their mobility in the process. The priests of Pama and the surviving Kotati formed a bond with the priests tending to their needs and keeping their location a secret from the other Kree, while the Kotati shared the secrets of the mind. 
Meanwhile, as their empire expanded, many Kree interbred with various alien species, with their offspring typically born pink-skinned. Eventually, the pink Kree outnumbered the blue, however, the blue Kree maintained their position as the upper class of their society. It became a common belief that pale-skinned Kree had only emerged as a product of interbreeding, and thus blue Kree were considered superior, becoming known as purebred. And at the same time, other civilizations evolved on various planets throughout the universe. The moon where the Kree had built the Blue City orbited one such planet, another world that had been visited by the Celestials, and thus became home to superpowered individuals. Our world, the Earth. The section of the moon with a breathable atmosphere became known as the Blue Area, named for the abandoned remains of the Kree City. Eventually, that city became home to Uatu, a member of the ancient race known as the Watchers, who observed and recorded the events of the universe while pledging never to interfere. When the priests of Pama were eventually exiled from Hala, they brought the remaining Kotati and planted them across the universe. The Earth was one of many worlds where the priests established a temple and lived undetected with the Kotati. There they awaited the coming of their prophesied Celestial Madonna. The rest of that story is perhaps best left for another day, but I did touch on it in my video on Jacques Duquesne, the Swordsman, so you can watch that for more information. Because that planetary system, the Soul System, our system, was near a natural space warp access used by the Skrulls, the Kree also established an outpost on the seventh planet, Uranus. This station was left unmanned, guarded by a Kree sentry robot number 213. Eventually, that sentry was attacked by a group of Eternals from Earth who had been exiled after a civil war with the rest of their kind, today referred to as the Uranite Heresy. Led by an Eternal fittingly named Uranos, this group successfully decapitated the Sentry, but doing so only attracted the attention of the Kree Empire. Fearing the Skrulls may have been behind the attack, the Kree dispatched a fleet to investigate. Upon reaching the Uranian outpost, they discovered no sign of their ancient enemies. However, they did find a ship leaving the planet, one made from parts and technology scavenged from the outpost. The Kree fleet struck quickly, destroying the ship before it could escape. Taking one of the bodies found in the wreckage, the Kree returned to their homeworld to examine it. And for the full story on what happened to the Uranites, you can watch my video on the history of the Eternals. From the one they captured and vivisected, the Kree discovered that he was related to the primitive ape-men dwelling on Earth. Thus, the Supreme Intelligence learned of the genetic potential of humanity. The Kree subsequently did their own experimentation on the ancestors of modern humans. There were several reasons for this, one of which was the hope that they could engineer a subservient superhuman race to use in their war against the Skrulls. Similar experiments were carried out on four other worlds, but the Supreme Intelligence calculated that this would eventually lead to his own demise, and thus the project was cancelled. The descendants of those experimented on by the Kree became the Inhumans, and those on Earth established their own society in the city of Adalan. The Inhumans were then left to their own devices, and the Kree left several sentry robots on Earth, most notably number 459, which observed the Inhumans' development. When the Inhumans discovered a method of unlocking their superhuman powers through a process called Terragenesis, they were visited by Sentry 459, who warned them to use their powers wisely, or else they may make enemies of the Kree. After that, the Sentry returned to its hidden outpost on an island in the Pacific where it remained for generations. The Kree also built a hidden citadel in Alaska which housed a backup plan called Atavis, which could be implemented if the Earth became a threat to the Empire. Throughout all of this, as the eons passed by, the fierceness of the kree skrull war ebbed and flowed, but the enmity between the two races remained. Over the course of the war, Skrull culture became more ruthless, favoring aggression and deception. 
Eventually, their seat of power was moved from their home planet of Skrullos to the more secure and centrally located Turnax 4. As human society progressed on Earth, the Skrulls also took an interest in their world, occasionally sending spies but not yet revealing themselves to the world at large. As for the Kree, by modern times they'd become an oppressive, militaristic regime. While Hala remained their sacred homeworld, the capital of their empire became the planet Kree Lar, named after Hala's capital city. Over time, their races were segregated and their society was influenced by eugenic philosophies. By this point, pink-skinned Kree were generally considered inferior half-breeds by many of the supposedly purebred Blue Kree. The supreme intelligence was worshipped like a god, with any descent being met with ruthless retaliation, often at the hands of the Accuser Corps, the enforcers of Kree law. However, the two highest-ranking officials, the Imperial Minister, Zarek, and the Supreme Public Accuser, Ronan, were secretly disdainful of the Supreme Intelligence's policies, resulting in such a high number of mixed-race Kree. So now, let us set the stage for Earth's involvement in the Kree-Skrull War. The war had entered a period of relative dormancy. While on Earth, the Marvel Age of Heroes had arrived, with superpowered humans beginning to appear with increasing frequency. The first group of superhumans to assemble as heroes in this modern age was the world famous Fantastic Four. And so early in this age, when the Skrulls plotted to take the Earth for themselves, they first sent four spies to impersonate and frame the heroic foursome, wanting to prevent them from interfering in the coming invasion. The FF uncovered this plot and defeated their alien doppelgangers, but one Skrull escaped. The Fantastic Four then prevented retaliation from the Skrull Empire by tricking their leaders into believing that Earth was better defended and more prepared for an alien invasion than it truly was at the time. In an attempt to tie up loose ends, Mr. Fantastic then hypnotized the three captive Skrulls, forcing them to forget their previous identities and transform into seemingly regular cows. Of course, the Skrull Empire soon uncovered the deception, beginning their long enmity with the Fantastic Four. However, they were also inspired by the Fantastic Four's powers and were able to successfully endow one of their own with the same abilities, transforming the soldier Kilret into the Super Skrull. Moving forward, sometime later, a Kree outpost was discovered on Earth by a human archaeologist, Dr. Daniel Damien, which caused Sentry 459 to reactivate. This Sentry also battled the Fantastic Four, but was damaged and left inactive when its outpost was destroyed. This prompted an investigation from their supreme public accuser, Ronan, but he too was defeated by the Fantastic Four. While Ronan escaped and wished to engage in a full-scale invasion after that, the Supreme Intelligence instead decided on a more covert operation, sending the starship Helion to spy on the planet. And so the Kree captain, Marvell, infiltrated the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, where the remains of Sentry 459 were being kept, by impersonating the human scientist Walter Lawson. It was there that Marvell first met Carol Danvers, who was the Cape's head of security at the time. Meanwhile, his superior officer, Jan Rog, was jealous of Marvell's relationship with the medic Una and secretly plotted his downfall. From the Helion, Jan Rog activated the sentry robot, which had completed its automatic self repairs, and attempted to destroy everything around it. Changing into his Kree military uniform, Captain Marvell announced himself to the sentry and defeated it, shutting down the robot once again. However, the military personnel present mistook the alien officer for a superpowered human, thinking he was a masked hero calling himself Captain Marvel. Meanwhile, Ronan, the accuser, and Zarek, the Kree Imperial Minister, watched from afar and plotted. And they weren't the only ones. 
The Skrull Emperor, Adoric VII, observed as a decorated Kree captain, seemingly became one of Earth's protectors, renewing their interest in the planet. As a result, Marvel battled their mightiest warrior, Kelrit, the Super Skrull. Sometime after that, Marvel's enmity with Yan Rog increased when his beloved Una was killed in battle and each man blamed the other. As time went on, Marvel grew disillusioned with his Kree masters and was later used in a plot by Ronan and Zarek. The two high-ranking officers attempted to overthrow the Supreme Intelligence and frame Marvel. As part of this plan, Marvel was endowed with enhanced strength and the ability to fly even in space. However, the Supreme Intelligence was aware of these plots and had manipulated events so that Zarek and Ronan would be exposed. For a more detailed account of these events, you can see my video on the origin and history of Captain Marvel. The important thing for today is that Zarek and Ronan were imprisoned, and Marvel was granted a new costume and allowed to keep the additional powers he'd been granted. However, as he attempted to make his way back to Earth, he became trapped in the otherworldly realm known as the Negative Zone. This antimatter universe and its de facto ruler, Annihilus, the living death that walks, were also previously encountered by the Fantastic Four. The Supreme Intelligence then secretly enabled Marvel to mentally contact a human on Earth named Rick Jones. Jones is a character we could easily talk about for an entire video, but the important thing for today is that he was a normal human who was close allies with the Incredible Hulk, Captain America, and the Mighty Avengers. Marvel led Rick Jones to a set of Kree artifacts that had been left on Earth, the Nega Bands. By striking the bands together while wearing one on each wrist, Rick was able to switch places with Marvel for up to three hours a day. Meanwhile, the Skrull Emperor, Dorek VII, was growing nervous. The Super Skrull had become incredibly popular among his people, but the program that endowed him with his fantastic powers had nearly bankrupted the Empire, something that Dorek was being blamed for. Hoping to eliminate his perceived rival, Doric assigned the Super Skrull an impossible task. Either capture or destroy Captain Marvel, the Avengers, and the Inhumans on Earth. Speaking of the Inhumans, they had continued to advance, living apart from humanity in the city of Adelan, under the rule of their mighty king, Black Bolt. However, Black Bolt's insane sibling, Maximus the Mad, had forged an alliance with Ronan the Accuser, so that when the Kree Empire eventually conquered the Earth, Maximus would rule on their behalf. Furthermore, Maximus was able to usurp the throne, inflicting his brother with amnesia and leaving him stranded in San Francisco. All of this leads us to the story arc which ran from Avengers number 89 to number 97, a set of issues which are collectively referred to as the Kree Skrull War. After learning that the Fantastic Four possessed a method of entering the negative zone, Marvel resolved to free himself permanently. After using the Negabands to switch places with Rick Jones, Captain Marvel broke into Reed Richards' lab in the Baxter Building. At the time, the FF were away at Whisper Hill, the home of Agatha Harkness, who babysat their child, Franklin. However, this intrusion into their headquarters sent an alert to their allies, the Avengers. And so, the Vision, Quicksilver, and the Scarlet Witch rushed to the Baxter Building on board their high-tech Quinjet, while Captain Marvel freed Rick Jones from the Negative Zone with the Fantastic Four's interdimensional portal. It seems the Avengers arrived just in time as Annihilus attempted to pass through as well, but was stopped by the assembled heroes. However, in the confusion, Marvel left the others behind, stealing the Avengers' Quinjet to escape. Desperate to return to his home galaxy after the harrowing experience of being trapped in the Negative Zone, Marvel headed back towards the Kennedy Space Center, but the Quinjet did not have enough fuel for the journey and crashed. 
Meanwhile, Rick Jones and the Avengers discovered that while in the negative zone, Marvel's body had been charged with building levels of radiation that potentially threatened the planet. The Avengers tried to stop him, but Marvel resisted their attempts to help and refused to listen. Until finally, it was Rick Jones who incapacitated him with a high tech weapon. The Avengers then brought him to the Space Center Hospital where the excess radiation was safely siphoned away, saving his life but leaving Captain Marvel unconscious. At the same time, in Kree space, Ronan the Accuser had been broken free from captivity and successfully overthrew the Supreme Intelligence. Plotting his revenge, Ronan reactivated the Kree sentry at Cape Canaveral, ordering it to capture Captain Marvel. He then began the next phase of his plan, activating the Atavis machine, left behind by the Kree millennia prior, which transformed the surrounding area into a prehistoric jungle, and would eventually do the same to the entire planet. However, two Avengers, Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne, otherwise known as Yellow Jacket and the Wasp, were doing research in Alaska at the time. When they lost contact with the three men who were stationed at a nearby outpost, they went to investigate and witnessed the effects of Plan Atavis. As they approached the devolving rays, the two began to black out, but Yellow Jacket was able to send the Wasp away while he plummeted into the jungle. The Wasp then contacted Clint Burton, who at the time was using Pym Particles to operate as Goliath. Burton then contacted the other Avengers who arrived with Rick Jones shortly thereafter. However, while Goliath investigated alone, he was defeated by Ronan, who had returned to Earth, and placed under the mental control of the Kree Sentry. Furthermore, Yellowjacket and the three technicians who had been stationed close to the Kree Citadel were transformed into primitive ape-like creatures. When most of the Avengers were defeated and held captive, Ronan's victory seemed to be assured. However, Quicksilver remained free and was able to break into the Kree Citadel. Ultimately, it was Rick Jones who saved the day by using one of Captain Marvel's Kree weapons to destroy the Atavis machine. This caused the surrounding area, including Pym and the three technicians, to revert back to normal. An enraged Ronan prepared to take his revenge, but more important matters soon came to his attention. Uh, the Skrulls had renewed their assault on the Kree galaxy, attacking their space lanes and decimating their vessels. While the Supreme Accuser was distracted by the Earth, the Kree Skrull War had reignited. Following Ronan's departure, the three technicians revealed what had happened to the U.S. government. The president swiftly appointed a commission on alien activities, led by a man named H. Warren Craddock. Craddock insisted that as many as 153 U.S. citizens were actually alien spies, prompting an anti-alien witch hunt. Ironically, it was Craddock himself who was actually an alien imposter, having been captured and replaced by a Skrull spy shortly before this. In fact, the fake Craddock was the very same Skrull that escaped from the Fantastic Four during their first encounter with the alien race. Craddock's crusade led to strong anti-alien sentiments and protests against the Avengers for harboring Captain Marvel. Marvel considered turning himself in, resulting in a debate among the Avengers. However, the Vision argued against the very notion that a man should be confined based solely on his race. Ultimately, Marvel's friend and ally, Carol Danvers, arrived to take him into hiding. Or so it seemed. Shield director Nick Fury was tasked with stopping Marvel, but having survived World War II and seeing the Japanese American internment camps, Fury allowed the Kree hero to escape. However, Marvel and Danvers reached their destination only to be captured by a group of Skrulls. Due to their lingering mental connection, that night Rick Jones had a dream reflecting these events. The following day, the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and the technicians from Alaska all testified before Craddock's Alien Activities Commission. 
However, the proceedings were interrupted when Rick's dream came back to him and he rushed out of the room. This caused a bit of an uproar, but Rick escaped and the session was put on hold until the following day. The Avengers then returned to their townhouse only to find that it had been ransacked by rioters. Furthermore, three senior Avengers, Captain America, Iron Man, and Thor arrived and formally ordered the group to disband. And so Goliath, the Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, and the Vision made their way to the farmhouse where Carol Danvers had brought Captain Marvel to decide their next move. However, when the Vision decided to fly ahead and survey the area, he was shot down. Shot down by three cows. Or rather, by three Skrulls. The very same who had once impersonated the Fantastic Four, only to be hypnotized into becoming cows. Hypnotized, that is, until they were revived by a Skrull hyperbeam from space. After that, they not only abducted Marvel and Danvers, but also impersonated the three senior Avengers and disbanded the team. And so those three then took the forms of the Fantastic Four members they'd learned to mimic and battled Quicksilver, the Scarlet Witch, and Goliath. While Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch were captured, a damaged Vision was able to use his powers of intangibility to escape and alert the real Captain America, Iron Man, and Thor. After being repaired by Hank Pym, the Vision led the senior Avengers back to his imperiled teammates. While the assembled heroes battled the Skrulls, Marvel and Danvers broke free of their bonds. With the battle erupting outside, Danvers convinced Marvel to alert the Kree Empire of the Skrull presence on Earth. And so Marvel began assembling a Kree Omniwave Projector, a device capable of sending a signal all the way to the Kree galaxy, but could also be weaponized to disastrous effect. He completed the device, but then he realized something was wrong. Crushing the Omniwave projector in his hands, it suddenly made sense when Carol Danvers called him by his true name. A name that at that time she didn't know. For it was not Carol Danvers who brought Marvel to the farmhouse where they were abducted by the three Skrulls, but rather Kelret, the Super Skrull, who wished to obtain a weaponized Omniwave projector for his own people. The Super Skrull was able to defeat Captain Marvel and escaped with both him and the captured twins Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch. The Skrull vessel took off with all four on board while the Vision flew after them. Meanwhile, the other Avengers defeated and captured the remaining three Skrulls. Before leaving the Earth, the Super Skrull launched an attack on the inhuman city of Adelan. However, the city was protected by an energy dome that the Skrull ship was unable to penetrate. The Vision also attempted to battle the Super Skrull, but when it became clear that neither opponent could handily defeat the other, the Vision fled, returning to the other Avengers, fearing that the Scarlet Witch might have been hurt if he'd escalated the combat further. And so Kelret brought his captives with him, returning to Skrull space. However, when the Super Skrull returned to the Skrull throne world of Tarnax IV, Emperor Dorek's forces opened fire. Jealous of Kelret's power, the Emperor had declared him in exile and claimed his prisoners for himself. The Super Skrull had hoped to gain the Emperor's favor and perhaps even the hand of his daughter Anel, but was instead imprisoned. Princess Anel protested his actions, but she was secretly in love with Captain Marvel. Dorek forced Marvel to build another Omniwave projector by threatening the lives of the captive Avengers. However, the Kree captain then used the projector to cast a lifelike hologram of himself, continuing to build it, allowing the Avengers more time to recover. And, in fact, during Marvel's time as a captive of the Skrulls, he shared a brief romance with Princess Anel. Back on Earth, because the Avengers failed to appear before the Alien Activities Commission for the scheduled hearing, the Impostocratic dispatched a squad of S.H.I.E.L.D. mandroids to arrest them. 
The Avengers were ultimately victorious in the ensuing battle, during which the aquatic inhuman Triton arrived. Triton explained his people's situation, and after recovering King Black Bolt, the assembled heroes headed to Adelan to free it from Maximus the Mad and his Kree allies. However, when Maximus was overthrown, his alien contact abducted Rick Jones before returning to the Kree galaxy. Using a S.H.I.E.L.D. spacecraft, the Avengers took to the stars, intent on rescuing their captive allies. However, upon reaching space, they beheld a harrowing sight. An entire Skrull armada, poised to attack Earth, merely awaiting the order. Intent on keeping the focus on themselves, the Avengers launched their own assault, boarding the Skrull flagship. The Skrull Emperor, Doric VII, taunted the Terran heroes, claiming the weaponized Omniwave projector would soon be in his control. However, Captain Marvel then enacted his own plan, freeing Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch. His plans ruined, Doric attempted to take his revenge by launching a warhead at Earth, but Goliath boarded the vessel carrying the weapon and stopped it. Meanwhile, Rick Jones was brought to Cree space, where he learned of Earth's importance as a strategic location between the Cree and Skrull territories. Jones was then imprisoned, but was soon contacted by the Supreme Intelligence. Jones learned that it was the Supremer who had secretly ordered his capture, and had been manipulating recent events from behind the scenes. The Supreme Intelligence then helped Rick Jones unlock his latent human potential, tapping into a near-infinite source of power known as the Destiny Force. He used this power to free himself from Ronan's forces by summoning manifestations of heroes he'd read about as a child. The Blazing Skull, the Patriot, the Angel, the Human Torch, the Vision, the Finn, the Submariner, and of course, Captain America. Guided by the Supreme Intelligence, Rick then used the Destiny Force to send out a powerful psionic blast, channeling it through Marvel's Omniwave projector, which spread it to all corners of both empires. The Kree Skrull War suddenly halted as each member of both races were frozen in time. All except for the Skrull who had replaced H. Warren Craddock, who instead reverted to his natural form. However, he was then beaten to death by the very people he'd whipped into an anti-alien frenzy. Rick then collapsed from the exertion while the Supreme Intelligence teleported to the Avengers and Captain Marvel to him. Rick was dying, so to save his life, Captain Marvel, now able to move again, molecularly bonded with him as the Destiny Force powers faded away. With the Supreme Intelligence retaking control of his empire and the Earth defended, an uneasy peace was established between the Kree and the Skrulls. Earth's heroes were returned home and, for the moment, the Kree-Skrull War was over. However, the consequences of this would continue to be felt throughout the years. While Captain Marvel was eventually separated from Rick Jones, he later perished under unrelated circumstances, succumbing to cancer. However, his brief romance with the Skrull Princess Anel had resulted in a hybrid child, half Kree and half Skrull. Doric VII sentenced the infant hybrid to death, but the young prince's nursemaid ferried the baby off-world to raise him as her own. That child, Doric VIII, the son of Captain Marvel, was brought to Earth and lived as a human under the name Teddy Altman. However, he eventually grew up to become the young Avenger Hulkling. Furthermore, in the aftermath of the Kree-Skrull War, Iron Man called together the most powerful and influential superhumans on Earth to discuss how woefully underprepared they were for such an event reaching their doorstep. Those in attendance included Doctor Strange, Professor Charles Xavier, Mr. Fantastic, Black Bolt, Prince Namor, 
and the Black Panther. Iron Man proposed that if they were better organized, not only would they have seen the war coming, but they would have been better prepared to fight it. After all, the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and the Inhumans each had pieces of information, but not the full picture. However, it was ultimately decided that combining their forces in an official capacity wouldn't work. Managing such a large force would be unfeasible, and its very existence would likely turn public opinion against already respected groups like the Fantastic Four. However, they did agree that meeting regularly and sharing information could be beneficial. All except for the Black Panther. While the others were happy to secretly convene and discuss what they thought was best for the world, the Panther was concerned about what would happen if they disagreed. While the Black Panther walked away, the others formed their secret society, the Illuminati. And one of the first things they did was go to the Skrull throne world to threaten Emperor Doric, warning him never to attempt another invasion of Earth. However, this backfired when the Illuminati were captured and examined by the Skrulls. While the heroes ultimately escaped, what the Skrulls learned that day would ultimately allow them to attempt a much more sinister infiltration of Earth. A secret invasion. But perhaps that's a story for another day. But thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, share the video, and subscribe for more Marvelous content. Be sure to leave a comment letting me know what Marvel hero or villain you want to hear about next. And as always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page where for only a dollar a month you can get your name in these special thanks here. So until next time, true believers, Excelsior!